So let me just ask you, when I look at the cross, or if you were to look at the cross, let me just ask you, what do you actually see when you look at the cross? Or let me ask you, what actually comes to mind when you see this cross? I mean, what do you think about when you see or think about a cross? Now, maybe for you, a cross is just a nice piece of jewelry. It's something that you wear around your neck, or maybe you grew up in church, and if you grew up in church, then you saw a cross in the church, and all you can remember is, man, looking at that cross and thinking, when will this service be over with? Or, or you find yourself maybe like others and you think of a cross as a grave marker. And you see a cross and somehow you think of cemeteries. Or, or you see a cross and, and it reminds you of a little roadside memorial that you pass on the side of the freeway. And it's got a cross, some plastic flowers, a name, and it's a place you assume something or someone died in a very tragic way. Or perhaps you've never really given the cross much thought at all. To you, a cross, it's, it's just like any other piece of art. It's just a decoration, no more than just a decoration. Or, or maybe for you, like a lot of others, you look at the cross and you think, man, this is just foolishness. It's just a foolish religious symbol or artifact, and it makes no sense whatsoever. But, but can I tell you what a cross actually means to me. You see, the cross is actually something incredibly special. As a matter of fact, the cross is so special that we don't even leave a cross sitting on the LCBC stages week after week. And, and oftentimes we're asked, and maybe you've wondered yourself, and you think, why doesn't LCBC ever have a cross on any of its campuses? And I guess the answer I would give you is, well, we actually do have crosses on each of our campuses, but we only bring them out for special occasions. And and the reason we only bring them out for special occasions is I don't ever want, and we don't ever want a cross to become mundane. We don't ever want the cross to become just a decoration that's there on the stage or in the building or around the building until we don't even notice it anymore and because the cross is way too special to ever become just a decoration. I guess it's kind of, for me as I think about it, it's kind of like Christmas decorations. And I don't know how you do Christmas at your home, but at our home, we love to decorate for Christmas. I mean, we go all out, or actually, I should say, we love for Ruth to decorate for Christmas, and we love for Ruth to go all out for Christmas. And, and I'll just tell you, Ruth does go all out, and Ruth is great at decorating, and she's especially good at Christmas. And, and so the Friday after Thanksgiving, the trees, the decorations all come out, and, and well, that was until we downsized last year. And until last year, we actually had seven Christmas trees of varying sizes that were all over the house. Now we've downsized, and I think we only have three or four. And, and we love Christmas at our house. And by the way, I've noticed that some of you must really love Christmas too, because as a matter of fact, some of you, you love Christmas so much that you actually leave your lights outside the house all year long. I mean, it's summertime. You still got the little icicle lights hanging from your roof. You must really love Christmas too. And, but for us, for Ruth and I, the middle of January, we start taking down the trees and the decorations. And, and you might say, well, why? If you love it so much, why do you take down the decorations at all? And, and I suppose that one of the reasons we take our decorations down is, is because we want them to be special. And, and if they were up all year long, I don't really think they would be so special anymore. And so every year, we take our Christmas decorations back down to the basement until the following year. And to be honest with you, I kind of think the same way about the cross. I want it always to be special to us. And so for me, when I actually take time to step back and, and think about the cross, and when I actually consider all that the cross represents, I'm incredibly humbled. Because when I take the time to think about it, I begin to realize Jesus actually bled and he died on a cross for me. He did it for me, and it's incredibly humbling to come to the realization that I should have been the one on that cross, not Jesus. And yet Jesus willingly stepped into my place, he changed places with me, and he died for me in my place. There was actually a writer in the Bible named Isaiah, and this is what Isaiah had to say about Jesus being on the cross. He said this, he said, it was our weaknesses, meaning our laziness, meaning our lack of discipline, our imperfections, our selfish desires. It was our weaknesses that he carried. It was our sorrow, sorrow that you and I carry because, because of our guilt, because of shame, because of foolish decisions, because of selfish actions. It was our sorrow that weighed him down. 
He was pierced for our rebellion, meaning our stubbornness, our pride, that sense that we always know the best way to do it. We know better than God. He was crushed for our sins, meaning all of our imperfections. He was beaten so that we could be whole, so that we could actually be satisfied and feel satisfied with life, so that we could actually love ourselves. And Isaiah said he was whipped so that we could be healed, no longer broken or ashamed. The Lord laid on him, meaning he paid the price for the sins of us all. Another writer, Peter, actually said, he, he being Jesus, he personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. Meaning that what Jesus has done for you and what he's done for me, is he's actually offered an exchange. And this exchange is our sins for his perfection. He willingly took on our sins, and Jesus offers an exchange. He says, look, I'll take your sins. You can have my perfection. But to make this exchange with Jesus, it means that we've got to be willing, first of all, to admit that we have imperfections, that we're not perfect. We've got to be willing to admit our own imperfections. And so today, we actually want to take time to just slow down and remember what Jesus has done for us and what he did for us on a cross, and see, God is big on the thing is of remembering, and, and we get busy, and we get distracted, and we get sidetracked by the troubles in our lives, and we forget what God has done. We forget a lot of things, and God asks us to actually remember, so today we're going to just kind of remember what Jesus has done for us, and, and so I want to begin by rewinding the clock about 2,000 years, and let's look at the last four, maybe five days of Jesus' life. Because before Jesus ever hung on a cross, Jesus knew exactly what was coming. He knew his death on a cross was coming. And Jesus had actually been telling people for days what was coming, but nobody understood what he had to say. And so five days before his death, Jesus actually arrived in Jerusalem after walking about 75 miles from the region around the Sea of Galilee. And he'd come to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of the Passover, and and he had also come to die, and so Jesus enters the city, and he enters riding on a donkey, and immediately he's surrounded with a crowd of people, and they're shouting his name. Matthew, a historian, actually said that some of the people actually threw their coats on the road ahead of him for him to walk on. Others cut palm branches out of the trees. They spread these palm branches on the road in front of Jesus, and and all along the way, people were shouting, and they were shouting and saying, praise God for the son of David, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heaven. And we're told in history that things got so loud and it was so raucous in the city that the entire city was in an uproar about Jesus and his arrival, and people were asking and saying, who is this? What's going on? Who is this, they ask, and, and the crowds replied, well, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee, and you can actually read more about this incredible procession into the city of Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 21. And, but the next day, Jesus pulls away, and he goes to the temple to pray, but when Jesus shows up at the temple, he found inside the temple what amounted to just this crowded flea market kind of a feel, and and Jesus becomes visibly angry, and he becomes so angry that he overturns tables, and he drives out the merchants, which likewise made all the religious leaders, those that were controlling the temple, it angered them greatly as well, and each day. Jesus would continue to go back to the temple, and while he was at the temple, he would teach. And as he would teach, he would push harder and harder against the religious leaders, challenging their ideas of what it meant to be a follower of God. And apparently, Jesus wasn't a big fan of the local religious leaders, and so he would say things like this. He he would say, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, he would say, you blind Pharisees, snakes, Sons of vipers, how will you escape the judgment of hell? That didn't sit so well with the religious leaders. And what Jesus was doing is he was chastising them for for their spiritual pride. He was chastising them for their hard hearts and for the religion of rules that they'd established that only served to alienate those who were lost. And, And with every accusation, Jesus further angered the religious leaders, and the anger continued to build and build and build. So by noon on Thursday, 
Jesus actually turned to two of his best friends, Peter and John, and he told them to go into town and prepare for the Passover feast. And the Passover feast was this annual Jewish holiday, and it was meant to remind them that though you once had been slaves, all of a sudden now you are free. And by seven o'clock that evening, Jesus and the other disciples had joined Peter and John for the meal, and Passover was actually meant to be a celebration. It was meant to be a time that was happy and just celebration, but, but on this particular night, it was anything but a celebration for the men with Jesus, and the apprehension in the room continued to grow, and everyone was conscious of the heightened tension between Jesus and the religious leaders, and they all wondered, what's going to happen to Jesus? And they wondered, what's going to happen to us as well? And So Jesus, doing what Jesus always seemed to do, he steps into the tension and he cuts right into the uncertainty with a statement that was so electric that we still know these words today. He said, I tell you the truth. Jesus is talking. He says, one of you eating with me here, you'll betray me. And Jesus knew exactly who was going to betray him, but he didn't say. And so in great distress, each one of those around the table, his disciples, they said, am I the one? And Jesus just replied, he said, it's one of you 12 who is eating from this bowl with me. It's one of you right here in this room. Now, interesting, over the final 24 hours of Jesus' life, every one of those 12 disciples would betray Jesus. Before the night was through, Judas would actually betray Jesus. Peter would deny him three times. And and all of the disciples, his 12 closest friends and followers, And they all left him and deserted him. They left him all alone to face trial at the hands of his enemies. And and Jesus might as well have said, all of you are going to betray me. And, And he probably could have said that about you and me. Because the reality is, all of us will at some point betray Jesus, every single one of us. I mean, every single one of us has said something. Every single one of us has done something. Every single one of us has thought something to betray Jesus, and that's probably just today, if not this week. And all of us make choices that go against Jesus, and going against Jesus is betraying him. And yet what I find remarkable, and here's what I think is worth remembering, even though Jesus knew that Jesus was going to betray him, Even though Jesus knew that Peter was going to deny him, even though Jesus knew that all of the others were going to desert him, Jesus still in this great display of love, he washes their feet and then he shares bread and wine with them. And from time to time, I'll see somebody around town that hasn't been at church in a while. And and typically, there's this moment of awkwardness, and, and it's followed by some excuse where they, I don't ask, they just kind of come out and say, oh man, haven't been in church lately, and, and there's reasons for it. One man actually said, you know what, I haven't been in church for some time because I did something, and what I did I think was hugely disappointing to God, and I just can't bring myself to come back to church. And I hear somebody say that, and it breaks my heart because every one of us, that could be said of us, all of us disappoint God, all of us will betray Jesus at some point. But, but here's the extraordinary thing, and here's the thing to remember the next time you betray God, the next time you do something, you go, oh, it goes totally against what God would want me to do. Here's the thing that you need to remember every time you disappoint God. Jesus, Jesus, despite the fact that he knew what this group of 12 were gonna do around him, Jesus actually said to this group of 12 who would betray him just in the next 24 hours, he says, you know what? I don't even call you servants anymore. Actually, now I call you my friends. And that's amazing to me because Jesus looks past their betrayal. He looks past their sins. He looks past all of their failures. And Jesus actually calls them friends. And here's the thing. In spite of all of your betrayals, in spite of of all of your sins, in, in spite of all of your failures, Jesus will do the same for you as he did for the 12. Jesus looks past your betrayals, he looks past all of your sins, and he looks past all of your failures, and he actually calls you his friend. And that's incredibly good news. I think that's amazing news. And Jesus and these friends sat down and they ate dinner. And over the course of this meal, Jesus actually gives an object lesson, and Jesus took bread, and he said, look, this bread, it represents my body, and and a body which, in just a matter of hours, 
would be lashed and pierced with nails and hung on a cross. And then Jesus took a cup of wine and, and he said, this wine represents my blood, blood that would be shed on the cross, blood that Jesus said this would confirm a covenant between God and all people. Now you need to understand a covenant is, is a contract. A covenant is an agreement between two people. And Jesus said his blood is gonna establish a new contract, a new covenant between all of humanity and God. Jesus was saying that from this, his death, God was gonna sign this contract that was gonna liberate all of humanity from slavery to sin and death. And in that moment, Jesus said what God is doing is God's giving the entire human race new life and a new beginning for those that choose to follow Jesus. God is gonna make them his children, his sons, and his daughters. And you see, through this meal of bread and wine and through this coming death of Jesus and his resurrection, Jesus is actually inviting all of humanity to become a part of God's family, God's children, God's sons, and God's daughters. And Jesus took the bread and he took the wine and he invited them to actually eat the bread and drink the wine. And it so often happened with his disciples, they didn't understand at all what was going on. They didn't get the analogy or why they were doing it. Nevertheless, they ate the bread and, and they drank the wine. And In the last 24 hours of Jesus' life, we find the story of God, a God whose love for his people is so amazing and so profound that he would actually send his son to lay down his life as a sign, as a seal to an agreement, to a contract from God that he would deliver the human race from death. And this meal, this communion, is to be this perpetual reminder of God's love and his sacrifice of his son. So here's the key. None of this would really matter if Jesus were still in the grave. If Jesus were still dead and buried in the grave, the cross really wouldn't matter at all. Jesus would have died a martyr, maybe even a hero, but no martyr, no hero can truly change lives for eternity. And it's the resurrection of Jesus that makes following Jesus different from following any other leader. I mean, Jesus is alive. It's a claim that's made about no other religious leader or leader of any kind. And You might ask me, you might say, David, how can you be so confident? How can you be so sure that the resurrection of Jesus is true? And I would tell you, I'm more than happy to tell you why I'm so confident. I'm more than happy to tell you why I believe it's true. It's because it's a historical fact, and yes, it's bizarre, and yes, it's far-fetched, and yes, it's not normal, but here's the thing. As bizarre as the resurrection of Jesus might seem, it's still a historical fact. You see, there were witnesses to Jesus and his resurrection. And we actually have the names of people who are eyewitnesses to the fact that Jesus is alive. Peter, James, and John, and over 500 people were witnesses to the fact that Jesus is alive. And so today, you and I are actually gonna share a meal together. We're, we're gonna do what the followers of Jesus have done for the last 2,000 years. We're gonna allow the bread and we're gonna allow the drink to help us remember what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And as we eat and as we drink, You need to know that there's nothing special about the bread or the juice or the wine or whatever it is that you're gonna eat and drink. It's just that, it's just bread, it's just juice. They simply help us remember the most significant event in all of human history. But you need to understand, before we eat, before we drink, I just need to give you a quick word of caution because God actually cautions us and tells us that before we eat and drink, we ought to take a moment and make sure that we come to eat and drink with a clean heart. And God says, The way we come with a clean heart is when we come to him and we confess what we know to be sin in our lives. And and you know what that is in your life. For you, maybe it's greed. Maybe for you, it's loose lips. Or maybe for you, it's anger and your temper. Maybe for you, it's jealousy or pride. Or perhaps you've been painting outside the lines when it comes to sexual purity. I mean, whatever it happens to be, God says, take this moment, come clean before him and confess what you know to be sin in your life. And so here's what we're gonna actually do. I'm gonna pray in just a moment and and then I'm gonna give you a few moments to talk to God, to just for you to come clean before God. Just tell him what you know to be sin in your life. And so go ahead and grab whatever you're gonna take for the bread, whatever you're gonna take for the drink. If you happen to be in one of our rooms, we've got these little cups and You gotta do it right or you'll never get to the bread. It's the little cellophane on the very top and you just pull it back and you can get that ready so you're not distracted once we start. And and 
you'll find the bread there if you're at home, whatever you need to do to get the bread. And then the band is going to play and hold the bread and hold the drink before you eat. We'll all eat and we'll drink together, but the band is going to play. But right now, let's talk to God and let's come clean. And talking to God, is, it's easy. You just, in your head, in your heart, you just say, oh, God, thank you for Jesus. You say, God, thank you for loving me. You say, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for the things that I do to disappoint you. I'm so sorry for betraying you with my actions today, this week, maybe this year. So I'm going to pray, and then I'll be quiet, and you talk to God, and then the bands are going to sing. Heavenly Father, God, we come to you, and we, we say thank you for Jesus. We come to you, and we say thank you for loving us. We come to you, and we say we're sorry. We're sorry for the times that we betray you. We're sorry for the times that we just disappoint. When we, we think we know better, we choose to go our way. We choose to go a different way than you're asking us to go. God, maybe it's greed. Maybe it's, maybe it's words that were used this week. Maybe it's thoughts that were in our head. Maybe it's actions that we took. God, we come clean before you now. Thank you for the fact that in spite of all of the messes and junk and sin in our lives, you're still willing to call us friends. Thank you for the fact that Jesus was willing to come, live a life that we couldn't live, a perfect life, and still chose to hang on a cross, and on the cross take on all of our sins, my sins, your sins. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his death. Thank you for his resurrection, that he's alive. And because of that, our lives can be changed now. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for Jesus, the fact that we can be his friend, the fact that we can be your sons, your daughters. Today we remember, and then we say thank you for the bread. We say thank you for the drink that reminds us of his body, reminds us of his blood. Put on a cross, shed for us, so that we could be your sons and daughters, so that we could experience forgiveness of sin. We say thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's because of Jesus' death that you and I can be sons and daughters of God. And so Jesus was with his closest friends and followers, and he, he took the bread, and he invited them to eat the bread. And, and remember, he called them friends. They weren't slaves anymore. They weren't servants. Um, but Jesus said, man, you are my friends. He said, take this in remembrance of me. And then Jesus took drink, and, and we drink the drink, and as we drink, we remember that promise, that covenant, that contract that God signed with the blood of Jesus in order to make it possible for us to be called his son in order to make it possible for you to be called his daughter. This covenant, Jesus said, he took the drink and he said, this cup, his blood, representing his blood, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, a new contract, drink this in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, thank you for the body of Jesus he was willing to come to earth and take on the body of a man, a human being. He was willing to go to a cross and hang on a cross for his blood, that he was willing to shed his blood so that we could be forgiven. To be used as a contract, a covenant between us and God. For God says, through Jesus, we can have life. What incredible mercy, what incredible grace you pour our way. And so God, we say thank you. 
We say thank you for loving us. What an amazing God you are. What an amazing son you have, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What an amazing Savior. What an amazing King we have. That He would come to earth to make this exchange possible. My sins for His perfection. Your sins for His perfection. So next week is Easter. Next weekend, we'll actually celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And So here's my challenge. Pick whatever gathering you're going to attend and be sure to bring a friend with you. And if crowds are a concern for you, then come on Friday, come on Saturday. All weekend, we'll social distance. What we ask is you keep two seats, just two seats between you, between you and the next party beside you. Or you can invite somebody to watch online with you. Pick a gathering with them and watch it together. And you go to the LCBC website for an invitation. But you can actually email to your friend and gather together. Today, if you'd like to actually talk or pray with someone about anything that you're experiencing right now, the chat on the screen is gonna remain open for the next 10 minutes or so. And so stick around, let us know how we can actually be praying for you. Or you can actually go to the LCBC website anytime and click on the prayer button and let us know how we can be praying for you. And if you happen to be in one of our LCBC locations, there are people down the front left corner of each of our auditoriums when we're finished Come on down. They would love to actually pray and talk with you. Well, CBC, this week, may the Lord bless and protect you. May the Lord smile on you. May he be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next week.